Hey guys, WeirdEvs here. We're gonna learn how to script with Lua for Roblox games. This is just a beginner tutorial, so we'll only be learning some of the fundamentals. I'll also be throwing in a few advanced subjects, but only in an introductory manner, so you guys don't get too lost. To be honest, I haven't been active on Roblox the past few years, so I am a bit rusty. I had to do lots of refreshing to get back up to speed, so if you guys could leave a like, I would greatly appreciate that. To start off, we're going to need to launch a Roblox game, and to do that, obviously, you're going to need to go to roblox.com. Once you're at roblox.com, you should see towards the top a button that says create, so if we click on that, it'll navigate us to slash develop, which basically looks like this. You might have zero games, but if this is your first time trying to do anything, maybe a couple of games, but just for this tutorial, I'll be creating a new game, so click on that button. And I'll choose base play just to keep things uh, clean. Then click create game. Then you should see a new game towards the top. I'll click on edit. And then this should launch Roblox Studio. If you don't have Roblox Studio installed, it'll probably start downloading in the bottom left here. You would just click on that installer and then it will pretty much run this right here. And once you're inside of your game, it should look something like this. If you're not already familiar with Roblox Studio, you just use this to actually create your game. I like to have my Roblox Studio look a specific way, so I'm going to be changing out the windows. I'll just get rid of this here. I'm going to keep output. I'm going to get rid of the terrain editor. I'm going to move properties more towards the left. And this is how I like it. Explorer, output, properties. And if you can't find these windows, you can always just go to view and then you'll find them up here. So output, output. You can always just hide it like that. Same for properties and same for the explorer. More on these windows a little bit later. Before we continue, you'll need to know a few things. First, you need to know data types. All you really need to know about is a boolean, number, and a string. These are really basic, the most common. You'll be learning these in another tutorial, but for now, just number, string, and boolean. Now let's create a script inside of server script service, and to do that, we'll need to navigate into Explorer, right click on server script service, insert object, and script. We'll just get rid of that here. The string data type is a text value. You know code is a string when you see characters wrapped inside of quotations. So something like subscribe to WRD inside of these quotes is a string. The number data type is literally just numbers. So if you put those numbers inside of a quotation, it now becomes a string, which you can tell from the syntax coloring. Numbers are blue and strings are purple, but just know that numbers do not have quotes around it. Because again, if it has quotes around, it is a string. Remember that. The boolean data type is just a true or false value. True means exactly as it does in plain English. True means yes and false means no. Again, writing them in quotations will actually turn into a string so you can't ever just write true instead of quotations and expect it to act as a boolean. This will be parsed as a string. In certain conditions it technically can be used as a boolean. So those are the three data types you really need to know about. They're pretty simple. Now let's use those data types inside of actual coding. We'll be writing something to console, or in Lua terms, print. So let's type in print, parentheses, quotations, hello world. Notice that we put a string inside of these parentheses. So now what it's going to do is output this string or text into this console here, the output. Navigating to the script menu tab, we would look for this play button with the Roblox character over. Click on this drop down menu button and then click on run and this will just run all the scripts inside of the game. And notice inside of the output it says hello world. So technically you just wrote your first script, congratulations. This is actually a big step, albeit a simple task. This is where lots of great developers start in learning a new language. The long time tradition of printing hello world. I know that this is extremely boring and seemingly useless, but we will do a lot more very soon, like move in a brick. Patience please. Now let's try printing the number data type, so again I'll just type in print parentheses and I'll just put in 99. Any number you feel like, you can make it longer if you want. Because we clicked on this run button here, you now see a play button so you can click on that and then you'll see that it prints this exact number into the output. Of course we can get the exact same output by putting it in quotations but by definition this is now a string not a number data type. In most situations this will be treated the same way as numbers. With a number data type you can do arithmetic so print 5 plus 5 and then you get 10 because 5 plus 5 is 10. And oddly enough, you can do 5 plus the string of 5, and then it'll still print out 10. Which is really weird because in other languages this doesn't work out, but whatever. Just something to keep in mind. And now let's try printing out the boolean data type. So print true. Let's also do another line of print false and run. You'll see it prints out true and prints out false. And of course you can't get the exact same output by just wrapping it inside of quotations, but again, it's not actually going to be a boolean value, because now by definition it's a string because it's inside of quotations. And just to show you, true and false again in the output. 
So that was a really simple quick start. As you saw, we inserted a script into server script service and we typed in code and then the game executed once we clicked on run. And I'm not sure if you noticed, but Roblox actually has a syntax highlighter. So when you make a string, you know it's a string because it's purple. When you have a Boolean, you know it's a Boolean because it's like this dark blue color. And when you have a number, you know it's a number because it has this light blue color. You can actually change the syntax highlighting colors, but by default, these are the colors you would see. So now let's move on to comments. Comments aren't actually code, they're quite literally just notes for the coder to read. It is completely ignored by the Lua executor. And when you have hundreds of lines of code, it's going to be difficult to kind of read through everything again, especially if you haven't looked at your code after weeks. So leaving comments can be a great refresher. Being a new learner of Roblox Lua, you'll definitely want to frequently write comments. So to write a comment, you would start off with a double dash, and then you would write your note right after it, which might be, this is a... YouTube tutorial, and then that will be ignored by the Lua executor. But like I said, comments are ignored by the Lua executor, so if I were to type in print then the string of hello world, it's not going to print into the output because again, comments are ignored. So let's run and show you. There's nothing in the output. But it's not like this disables the entire script because if I were to type in print blah blah, it'll still print it to the output. You see blah blah because this isn't commented out. But if I were to comment it out, now it doesn't run. So it's really useful to just leave notes above your code. So as you should have noticed, the double dash only works for one line. So this is called a single line comment. It doesn't actually comment this out because as you saw, it still executes. But if you wanted to comment out multiple lines, you would use something called a multi-line comment. And to write that, you would type in double dash, two opening brackets, two closing brackets, and then two double dashes. And then in between that, you would type in your comment. So this is a comment. Yay. Put code in between that just to show you that it is an actual comment. This shouldn't print. And then under our comment, but this will print. So we're going to expect this to not print, but we'll expect this one to print. As you see, that works. We're almost done here. One more thing with the boring stuff. So let's move on to variables. A variable is nothing but a name given to a storage area that our code can manipulate. It can hold different types of variables. So a variable can hold a boolean, a variable can hold a string, and a variable can hold a number. So if you were to pick the variable name of my var, my variable, and then say equals one, two, three, my var is now this exact same thing as one, two, three. So now if I were to print my var, notice it's case sensitive. So you would have to type it exactly as you named it, capital V, capital V here and run. You'll see that it outputted one, two, three. Your names can be almost anything. So like I can literally just do this. Like that's complete nonsense. It's not reserved anywhere and then just paste that inside of print, it'll print out one, two, three. There are a few names that you can't use. For example, print, because print is already used by Lua, so you're gonna have to pick something else. Another thing to note is that you can't start your variable name with a number, so this will not work, it's gonna error, and you know it's a problem because it has this red underlining here. But you can't end your variable name with a number. And I'm to show you that variables can work with other data types, so I'll create a string and say, please like this video. Hint, hint, we'll print that out. And then you should see, please like this video in the output. You can even do arithmetic inside of your variable. So one plus one, you should expect it to print out two because one plus one is two. As you can see, two. We can even use the Boolean data type we learned. So my var true. And then it should print out true because my var is equal to true. So that's all the boring stuff out of the way. So now let's try actually manipulating the game. I'm going to right click in the game here and insert part and now you just got this brick in your 3D space. So now if you click on the brick and then look inside of your properties window, which if you copied me, I moved my properties window to the left, you'll see a bunch of properties listed down here. To the left is the property name and to the right is the property value. If I wanted to change brick color inside of the game, I can just click on the brick and then choose a different color here. So if I choose red, it's going to be red and then you see its name is really red. If I choose black, then its color is black. Instead of changing the color manually, let's try doing this with the script. Navigating back to our script that we created, I'm going to say game.workspace.part. 
So this works the same way as a file tree would, like how you would navigate through your folders inside of Windows. So game is basically your game explorer. And then from game, we would go into workspace. And then from game, we would go into part. And by clicking part, you see that it is highlighting this. It's selecting the part inside of workspace and workspace is inside of game. Now let's select the brick color property. So dot brick color. This is case sensitive. So when you're gonna select part, you're gonna want to select the exact name. Notice it has a capital P, so I put in a capital P. Brick color has a capital capital B and C, so I put in a capital B and C. And just like you would with a variable, you can set the value by using the equal sign. And then we'll put in brick color dot new parentheses. And then we'll put in the string data type being whatever new color we want. So if I manually change this to white, so now you know it's white. And then say the string value will be black. And then we run this script. You'll see that it changed the black. Now let me just show you a quick little something. If we put in weight and then parentheses, you should pass in a number here and it will say three. The number inside of the parentheses of weight is just the amount of seconds that should pass before it moves on to the next line. So we're going to wait three seconds before it changes the color to black. And then we'll add another weight down here. We'll say three seconds again. We'll navigate down the file tree again to game.workspace.part.brickcolor equals brickcolor.new parentheses and then your string of whatever new color you want so eggplant we just type in that brick color name and then it should change it to eggplant after three seconds so again so when we click on run the script is going to wait three seconds and then it will change the color to black it'll wait three seconds again and then it will change the color to eggplant which is purple basically so navigating back into this game view tab you can go over to the test tab and then click on the run button Wait three seconds, it's black. Wait three seconds again, it's now eggplant. And looking at the property, you see it says eggplant. So you pretty much just did a lot in this script. You use the number data type to make the script wait three seconds before moving on to the next line. And then use the string data type to pass a new value for brick color. So now I'm gonna create a problem just to show you how Lua works a little bit. I'll copy this brick. I'll repaste it back into workspace. And now looking at this code here, you're going to see it's going to try navigating to game.workspace.part. So the game explorer workspace.part and then change the brick color to black. Let's see what happens. You see that I only changed one. If you wanted to change both, obviously that's a problem. So to solve this, we would just select one of the parts that has a duplicated name, right click it, click on rename, and we'll just say brick2. It could be any name, of course. Now if we navigate to game.workspace.brick2, again, case sensitive, and then set brick color to equal to brick color dot new plum. Now if we run, you now see that both of these brick colors were changed. And of course, if you wanted to change it to black, then go ahead. I'll change. They'll both change to black. Let's make this file tree navigation slightly more complicated. So I'll be grabbing brick two and then drag it inside of part. We just made brick two a child of part. So to navigate down to it, we're going to have to do game dot workspace dot part dot brick two. And now you can do brick color equals brick color dot new black. As you can see, that worked. But if you were to just do game.workspace.brick2.brickcolor, this doesn't work because Brick2 is not a valid member of Workspace. Because you don't see Brick2 instead of here. It's inside of part. And that just means there's no direct child of Workspace that is named Brick2. You'd have to go workspace.part.brick2 like we saw inside of the script here. So now I'll just delete brick two, make things slightly more simple. And let's try changing another property. Let's say we wanted to change the position. Obviously we're gonna need to navigate to the part. So game.workspace.part.position equals vector three dot new. And a vector three value is basically the position inside of a 3D graph. So let's set the X value to five, the Y value to 10 and the Z value to 15. You would have to delimit these by using a comma and by running the script, you're going to see that the part is moved. It went all the way here and clicking on the part. So selecting the part and then looking at the position property, right clicking on this drop down button here, you see the X is five, Y is 10 and the Z is 15. Of course, you can manually change that here to figure out what direction is. So, oh, 
should have made that anchored. Well, now you know that to change the position, you'd have to do vector three and then enter the X, Y, Z position values, which are numbers. Now let's try solving that problem, how the brick kind of just fell. So I'm going to go over to this model tab, select move, and I'll just drag this up a bit. I'll just get rid of this code to get rid of any interference. And if you go back to test and run, the brick should fall because we did not set the anchor value. But if you click on the anchored checkbox, this basically sets anchored to the value of true. It should stay in the air. We just anchored its position. It's going to stay exactly where it is. But once you disable anchored, it falls. Now that you change that's how your script, you would obviously navigate to your part again. So game.workspace.part.anchored equals true. Let's disable that manually. So now it's going to set it to true. We will expect this brick to not fall once we hit run. And great, it doesn't fall. Now let's set this manually to true. So if we hit run, obviously it doesn't fall. But to make it fall using the script, we'll say anchored equals false. And then you see it does fall because it is no longer anchored thanks to you setting the anchored property to false. You'd pretty much change all the other properties the same way using the three data types I showed you in the beginning of this video. String, number, and booleans. Except for the few special things, like we saw with color, we had to use color3.new. Let's try changing the material. If you click on this drop down button and select grass, you see it gives it this different texture. To change that using a Lua script, you would obviously navigate to your part, game.workspace.part, select the material property, and then we'd set that equal to a string value. So as you can see, it's a string. To check out the options we can choose, again, you would just look at this drop down menu here, and let's say I want to use foil. I'll put foil inside of this string and then run and now and now you see it just changed to the foil material if we get rid of the quotations it's no longer a string and it's pretty much expecting a variable or a global but that's more advanced i'll teach you what globals are in another tutorial foil isn't defined anywhere so this will error and now you see it's not changed the foil so now you know that you have to use quotations if you're going to try to set a string value I should have showed you this a while ago, but let's try setting a value using a variable. So let's choose a variable name. I'll say mat bar material variable, set it equal to foil. Let's copy that variable name and then put it right here. And now it should set the parts material to foil. You could have done that with positions too. So I'll just name the variable to my var equals vector three dot new. I'll say five, 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 say game that works with a part dot position equals my var. So now we no longer have to do equals vector three dot new because we can just use the variable which already has this value here. So we'll hit run and then you should see that the position will change to five 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 as you saw. Position five five five. So you'd pretty much change all the other properties the same way. If you wanted to change cast shadow, you see it's a checkbox. So you would say gain a workspace part that cast shadow equals false. You should already know how to change color, the change material. Obviously you see it's a string. So you would set the value equal to a string being whatever options you can choose. Reflectance would be a number value. So you would say gain a workspace part to reflectance equals 0.5. We don't see it because the material is weird. To see the reflectance, you're going to want to set it back to plastic. And now you should see that the reflectance is changing. So back to zero, no reflection, back to one. Then you see that the cloud is reflecting onto the brick. Same thing for transparency. You would say gain that workspace that part that transparency transparency equals a number value, one being completely invisible, zero being completely opaque, you can see it, 0.5 being half invisible. So let's set this back to fully opaque and let's try changing the transparency with the script. Game.workspace.part.transparency equals a number value. And again, it's from zero to one. So 0 0.5 to make it half invisible. Hit run and now you see it's half invisible. At the change the name, you would pass in a string because as you can see, that's what it is. It's a string. Orientation, you see it's got these three values with the two commas. You know it's a vector three position. So game that workspace dot part dot orientation equals vector three dot new and then your three vector values. Position vector three, but rotation velocity vector three, velocity vector three. Then your booleans here, number, blah blah blah. It's pretty obvious. So I pretty much just taught you more than enough to get going with basic Lua scripting. You know what I consider to be the three basic data types, string, number, boolean. You know how to navigate the game's file tree using a script and then change changing a brick's properties, you know how to use the console, and, uh, you know, and you know how to use comments to leave notes under your code. You learned a lot. And that concludes this beginner's Roblox Lua crash course. There is so much more to learn, but that's all I'm going to be teaching in this beginner's tutorial. 
If you want to be getting deeper into Roblox Lua, check out the Roblox Lua documentation or look out for videos on this channel. If you don't see many other videos, subscribe and just look out for them. So if you like this video, please leave a like. I'd really appreciate that. Thanks for watching and have a good one.